Okay, guys, I might make a start. I think it's just one minute past three. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome to Source. For anybody who's new to Source, Source is a series of online research software events. Uh, very happy to have you here. Um, this is our sort of way of keeping the community together uh, while we none of us can meet up in person. Um, I'm your host uh, for today. Uh, my name is Terry Foy. Um, don't worry, I will not be speaking for long. So uh, what's going to happen today is we have a panel discussion. Um, uh, before we actually go to that, could everybody please have a look at our code of conduct if you haven't looked at it before and could everybody please follow our code of conduct? Um, yes, so today panel discussion uh, led by Matthew Bluto, we've got Alice Brett, uh, Richard Reeve, Christopher Woods, Rich Fitzjohn and Lilith Whittles, all as our excellent, excellent panellists. But before we begin, I do have a few notices. Um, so we have a huge programme uh, for Source. Uh, there's events happening pretty much every week. Um, so do, do check out some other events. Uh, the next one is on January the 20th, where we have a lightning talk session. Um, and this is, we've got a whole series of people coming to do some lightning talks. Each one of those talks is being backed up by a blog post or by a poster. Um, so it should be, and then you get a chance to, to hear the lightning talk and then chat with the uh, presenter uh, in, in a Zoom room. So that should be really good. Do come along. Um, if you want to submit something, there is still time. Uh, the next submission deadline is at the end of this month. So um, coming to the end of January, if you want to get in and do some presenting, I would really would encourage you to get involved and do that. All the information is on our website at source.github.io. Okay, so uh, this event is being recorded. We are being recorded right now. Uh, we will be publishing this online on YouTube uh, once we've processed the video afterwards. Um, so please, actually, I would ask everybody to please keep their microphone off throughout the event. Um, you can obviously take the videos and microphones off um, at the end if you want to have a bit of a chat. Um, questions will be taken in Slido in this session. So feel free to still chat in the Zoom chat, um, but I would ask you to ask questions in Slido and Matthew will give you some more details about that. So. I don't think there's anything else I need to say. Um, welcome along. This is our panel session, research software and the modelling of COVID-19 in the UK. And I'll hand over to Matthew. Great, thanks, Terry. And welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, well, welcome to this panel discussion on, as, as Terry said, research software and the modelling of COVID-19 in the UK. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to tune in. So given this is the first source event of 2021, I, I guess I also have the, the privilege of wishing you all a happy new year. Uh, although admittedly, it has probably hasn't been the start that we were all hoping for. Um, as said, I'm, I'm Dr. Matthew Bluto, your moderator for today. And I'm an RSC at the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Uh, I'd like to say a quick thank you to the, the source organizers uh, for making this particular event possible, uh, along with all the others in the previous year. At this point, uh, I, I sense that most of us are probably a bit tired of reading about and listening to COVID-19 in the news, uh, and that this is truly an episode in history that we probably all want to put behind us as quickly as possible. However, like all significant events, uh, I think there are undoubtedly important lessons to be learned from this. Uh, and this is no less true for us in the burgeoning RSE community. Moreover, it, it seems fitting that we discuss how our community has directly responded to the very crisis that is, is indeed the cause for these online events to be necessary. Near the beginning of the pandemic, uh, many will remember that questions surrounding the code quality of some leading epidemiological models came to the fore of public attention and scrutiny. As RSEs, I, I would hope that we, we all had an intimate understanding of the challenging context under which research software is developed. And some of the leading voices in our community took the opportunity to communicate this challenging context in response to all of the criticisms. But fundamental questions still remain about how we ensure the public maintains trust in research software and that some research software is robust enough to withstand crisis situations and use in government policy. In the UK specifically, there was a groundswell of local and national initiatives uh, like the Rapid Assistance in Modeling a Pandemic, RAMP, 
uh, which arose to support the massive demand for infectious disease, mo disease modeling. Research software engineers played a pivotal role alongside modelers to make these efforts a success. Uh, and a long list of projects are listed on the Society of Research Software Engineering website, which hopefully one of my panelists will post the chat shortly. And you can go there and get further information about them. Um, our panelists today come from three different modeling groups uh, and they each have, different, have had different roles and, and approaches. I'm confident that everyone in the RSC community uh, will find valuable information and insight as we explore their experiences uh, and that, that this will offer an opportunity to further develop conversations around the RSC role. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, uh, I will explain briefly about audience questions as was mentioned at the start. Um, so as said, we will be using Slido uh, instead of Zoom's built-in Q&A function. Um, so I'm now going to post the link to that. And it looks like, okay, that, that has already been done. Thank you, Terry. Um, so please follow that link to go and start posting your questions. Uh, in Slido, it's, it's a fairly intuitive um, interface. Uh, if you haven't used it before, uh, I'll also let you know that there is an upvoting functionality associated with it. So. Uh, if you see a question that either is very similar to one you were going to ask or you just think would be worthwhile to be answered and raised, please do uh, give it an upvote. This will help us as a, as a panel um, really select which questions you want to hear about as an audience so it, it's the best for everyone's experience. Um, I'm also aware it, it's quite likely that some of our audience members uh, will have contributed to different COVID-19 modeling projects. Um, and I would welcome those people to submit any comments or points of information that they might have uh, in the Zoom chat uh, as, as we go along. So that not a question, not going to Slido, but you just have a point of information, you, you can throw that into the chat on Zoom. Um, I, I think everyone in the audience and, and the panel itself will certainly appreciate all, all the viewpoints and, and more viewpoints. Um, and these footnotes that you have may help inform the discussion further. So without further ado, uh, I'll now start introducing our panelists for today. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Richard Reeve, who is co-director of the Boyd Orr Center for Population and Ecosystem Health at the University of Glasgow, where he is a reader in the Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health and Comparative Medicine, and an affiliate PI in the MRC Center for Virus Research. Richard's background is in maths and artificial intelligence, uh, but he moved into e ecology and epidemiology in 2007. He works on uh, vaccine selection and antigen variability of viruses, especially uh, respiratory diseases like the flu and foot and mouth disease. And this has led to work on measuring diversity in a variety of fields from population genetics to biodiversity measures that quantify changes uh, to threatened ecosystems. He has also been a strong advocate for the role of RSEs in his research field. Richard, thank you today for joining us. Uh, could you please, to start off, give us a recap of how your work led to your involvement in COVID-19 modeling and perhaps also what your connection to the RSE community is? Uh, sure. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Um, as far as my connection to the RSE community is concerned, um, uh, as Matthew said, I, I came into uh, the life sciences from um, artificial intelligence in 2007. And um, and I didn't know uh, any biology, uh, so so it seemed obvious to me that what I needed to do was to find a role as an RSE. Um, but unfortunately, the word hadn't really been invented at the time, and I spent several years uh, fighting the university, trying to persuade them that this was a good idea, and ultimately failing, I'm afraid to say. So although I've been a strong advocate of uh, RSEs, I haven't been an entirely successful one. Um, the, um, yeah, and, uh, and I ended up, um, uh, with a kind of traditional academic job in the end, I guess I learned enough, uh, um, ecology and epidemiology to justify my existence. But, um, 
but yeah, from the point of view of 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 this of of the work on COVID, um, that really relates more to the to the Boydor Center for Population Ecosystem Health. So we're a virtual center. Um, it sounds very important being co-director, but we have no money. Um, uh, we're um, so so we 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 cross about twelve different organisations, um, and um, and so we when in in early March, we were discussing uh, amongst the PIs who are part of the center, whether there was something useful we could do um, to contribute towards the, um, the, pan the imminent pandemic. And we concluded um, that there wasn't really. Uh, so, uh, so, so a large component of the center actually does the animal disease modeling for um, uh, for the Scottish government, uh, for for animal disease outbreaks, so foot and mouth disease outbreaks, so on and so forth, and um, and so we've got a lot of experience of building these models, but we know the people doing the the human pandemic modelling perfectly well, and we know what their capabilities are, and we felt that we just didn't have, in particular, the RSE resources that would be necessary for us to do anything um, hugely productive on our own. Um, and then obviously uh, the Royal Society announced this ramp initiative and so we suggested to them that we could run a consortium and we would recruit RSEs uh, um, and so uh, and so that's so that's how we got involved that we that we've been running that consortium since then um, and there are now kind of 30 different organizations or something in the consortium with people offering small amounts of fractional time volunteer work and so forth um, to help with this and um, yeah, so that's me. Great, thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, and sorry to hear the unsuccessful RSE attempt. <laughs> I think probably a common story. Um, so our, our next panelist, which which ties in directly to to Richard's work, uh, is Alice Brett. She is the head of the software engineering group at the UK Atomic Energy Authority, uh, the UK's national lab for fusion energy, which hosts Jet. Uh, the world's leading experimental fusion reactor at the moment. Her education is in physics, uh, and she worked as a web developer for Oxford University before joining UK AEA as a software engineer in 2007. She contributed to systems and tools for working with experimental data, and her group uh, now has teams focused on research software engineering, research data, and business information systems. She has been involved in the RSE movement since 2015, and importantly, was the founding president of the Society of Research Software Engineering. Alice, thank you for joining us. Uh, I, I imagine some people in the audience are, at this moment are probably wondering how someone with a physics background working at a fusion laboratory is on a panel about COVID-19 modeling. Um, could you give us a brief introduction about how you got involved with that, what your role was, and indeed your connection to, to Richard? Yeah, sure. It certainly wasn't something I would have expected uh, a year ago, I can tell you that. But um, so really, we're in the early stages of the pandemic. I was aware of um, quite a lot of RSEs getting involved in trying to help with the, the modelling effort, and especially when it was a lot of publicity about it in the news and things at the time. So I was kind of a spectator of all of that. And as the president of the society at the time, I was very interested in, you know, this seemed like a, a real clear case study of the need for RSEs. Um, so I really got involved when the ramp call went out from the Royal Society. So we put, as a national lab at UKAA, we kind of saw that as part of our remit to help out if we could, you know, with a sort of national priority. So we put together quite a substantial response offering, offering some volunteer effort where we had no idea if or where it might be needed. But I put together a response about RSE um, skills we had available as well as other things in the organization. And then a month or so later, I think we heard from Richard who was um, one of the first people being, um, being asked to sort of draw on this volunteer effort. So we, we had a video call and from a day later, we were sort of in the thick of it, really. So this um, this enormous collaboration being put together, and really as somebody who hadn't been a sort of hands-on programmer for a while and have moved fairly squarely over to the management side in recent years, I kind of felt that the best thing I could do would be to try to help um, coordinate this RSE volunteer effort. Sort of, I think Richard was 
like amazed by all the resource that they had to draw on, but wondering how on earth are we going to turn this into something manageable? How are these um, six modelers going to make the best use of all this amazing skilled, you know, goodwill and, and volunteering? So that was my role on the project really was to sort of join the management group and try to um, make the best use that we could of all of this uh, RSE effort available. So I was largely working to put the teams together and to try to um, set expectations on both sides about how that partnership would work and um, anything that cut across all the different modeling projects, any shared approaches, that kind of thing. Great, thanks, Alice. Um, yeah, look, look, really looking forward to diving into uh, its SCRC, just in case that wasn't clear to anyone in the audience, uh, that that's sort of the, the consortium, the Scottish COVID response consorti consortium uh, that you are, you and Richard are, are were both involved in. Okay, um, next, our next panelist is Dr. Christopher Woods, uh, who is an EPSRC RSE fellow at the University of Bristol where he leads the Research Software Engineering Group. He works in the Advanced Computing Research Center and the School of Chemistry. Uh, Christopher's background is in computational chemistry, developing improved methods for biomolecular simulation. And he's also a founding trustee of the Society of Research Software Engineering. Thanks for coming on the panel today, Christopher. Like Alice, you have a background that isn't directly in epidemiology, could you explain how you got involved in COVID-19 modeling and what exactly the project was that you were working on? Thanks. Um, so essentially, semi-similar to Alice. So in March, obviously, we were seeing um, all of the, the questions that were being raised about code quality. And uh, we had, um, basically, in a collaboration with Bristol, one of the epidemiological groups who were using software to make predictions, which were feeding into the SAGE documents. And there was this kind of oh crumbs. We've seen what's happened to other COVID codes. The academic and then feeding through into the university, we were concerned that something very similar could be happening with this academics code. Um, and so it was sort of urgently, we need to have a look at this code and see, is it okay? Is there any, you know, preemptively get ahead of any problems that might sort of come into it. So the code was handed over to my group because I run the Central University Research Software Engineering team. Uh, we began looking at it and then um, essentially it became clear that while the code is, you know, is classic research code, foundationally good, there was a lot of engineering that needed to be added so that you could build trust and uh, sort of robustness into the code. And then also it was clear that over the next coming months that the foundation of code that existed was not in any way really going to be capable of being able to be stretched with the demands that kind of the professional modeling that would be needed would that it would have to take. So essentially we took the decision in mid-March that we kind of had to full-time go into basically re-architecting and developing the code and building trust in it, giving the full RSE treatment to it in a way that wasn't going to disrupt or slow down the epidemiologists we were working with. So it was uh, the MetaWards project and uh, yeah, it was, uh, we learned a lot. Um, I had to learn a lot of epidemiology um, and uh, I think people we were with led some good research software engineering, good practices as well. So yes, it was a fun collaboration in very difficult and pressing times. Great, thanks, Chris. And uh, yeah, we certainly we'll, we'll be looking to hopefully uh, go through some of those lessons and, and things that you learned in, in that very interesting uh, project. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Lilith Whittles. Uh, she is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Infectious, Infectious Disease Epidemiology, Imperial College London. Uh, prior to the pandemic, her research focused on the mathematical modeling uh, of various transmissible diseases, uh, including gonorrhea in the context of antimicrobial resistance, the EAM plague, hope I pronounced that right, uh, and HIV in men. Uh, her work has been featured in Time Magazine and on BBC Radio 4's Inside Science. Lilith, it's great to have you with us today. Could you quickly describe uh, how you made this pivot to COVID-19 modeling uh, and what that work has actually involved? Sure, thanks for having me, Matthew. Um, so in common with the other panelists so far, um, I made the pivot around March, April time last year when um, 
uh, we're part of the MRC Centre for Global Infectious Disease Analysis, which is has a, a specific outbreak um, responsibility. So it was very much all hands on deck um, in April, March, April time. So um, I offered a small amount of uh, my spare time to helping with the data collection and have ended up basically full time for the past year. Um, <laughs> but um, it's yeah, it's been um, a fascinating and uh, incredible opportunity to be part of a really amazing team. So I'm specifically part of the UK, a real time modeling team. So um, we feed directly into SPYM, which then feed into SAGE and then give advice to the government. Uh, so basically we are um, fitting a stochastic model of COVID-19 to um, all of the, the UK regions pretty much every night, synthesizing multiple different um, data sources in to get the best kind of model fit that we can um, given all the available evidence at the moment. And then we uh, use those fits um, to then go on to answer potentially interesting policy questions such as potential impact of vaccination and um, also yeah, important questions such as when might we, might we be able to lift um, the uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that are currently in place. So that's been ongoing um, since March and very much continues apace. Yeah, indeed. I, I imagine there's been a revival with the uh, most recent wave and, and well, such. Yes. Revival uh, suggests there might have been a lull. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay, thanks, Lilith. And we'll, yeah, we'll definitely be, be diving into that very shortly. Um, and, and finally, uh, our last panelist uh, is Dr. Rich Fitzjohn who runs the research software for infectious disease epidemiology uh, acronym reside group at Imperial College. Uh, he has worked with epidemiologists in the MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis for the last five years, uh, including the response to previous Ebola outbreaks. Before becoming a full-time RSC, uh, Rich was a computational biologist looking at questions surrounding diversity, both in the tree of life and ecosystems, which I believe overlaps a bit with some of uh, Richard's work. We'll see if that comes out at all in the, the discussion. Um, Rich, thanks for joining the panel. Could you give a bit of background about how Reside fits into the COVID modeling efforts at Imperial uh, and your own personal involvement, especially in relation to uh, Lilith's work? Sure, so um, Reside has, has existed within the department and within the center specifically for, for the last five years, partly um, as, as Neil Ferguson, who heads up the center, saw the need to have some sort of um, backbone RSC capacity within the group that wasn't tethered to any one project. So it, it comes out of our basically bulk funded um, grant. And we, we've had the flexibility more or less to work on whatever projects um, we find interesting and whichever ones have, have, have yelled out the loudest for help. And at the moment, that's, that's obviously been, um, been COVID. So, uh, yeah, so we started working on this on, on COVID back in January. Uh, I was in a hotel in Côte d'Ivoire at a workshop for HIV, frantically trying to set up a data pipeline as we were starting to collect, um, collect data. So we can, can pinpoint it. Um, so since then, yeah, we've, we've had uh, about three members of our team working more or less full time on this, um, and we sort of everything from from our data pipeline that serves the real time modeling efforts. So every night we get data in from about twenty different sources. Um, the people who look after the data and the very yeah, they've their data is changing, so our data ends up changing. So they try to make sure that by the time it hits the modelers, it's all uh, in, in a format that they expect, um, and then in providing infrastructure support for, for the modeling efforts so that the epidemiologists are building their models on top of um, sort of strong foundations so both with, with the group that, um, that Lilith described and then also with some groups who are doing some work with low and middle income countries and the GLI within my group has been working there trying to um, take the take the research that 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 group's been doing and get it um, get it running um, on, the, on the web so we have sort of varied um, very projects back back in March and April it was it was it was completely intense so, so we had lots of different groups working in lots of different countries uh, and a lot of the time then was just sort of getting getting people spot a lot of a lot of technical um, advice uh, more than more than the sort of the, the, the in-depth modeling that things have, have settled down to now yeah indeed I I, I can only imagine 
um, and look, again, looking forward to to diving into some of the lessons that that sort of came out of that. So um, now we're going to move on to uh, a bit of what I call moderated discussion. So I, I'm going to pose a, a few questions to uh, some of the panelists. We will go through that and then uh, afterwards get to any audience questions that, that have come in and, and start fielding those. So I'm going to start off with uh, Alison Richard and the SCRC. Um, you know, so, so hopefully people from, from the introduction, uh, people in the audience have, have gathered that there, we, we have sort of three different groups here. We have SCRC, uh, we, we have uh, Christopher Woods and the, the MetaWards project, and, and we have the, the sort of various modeling efforts at Imperial College. And looking now at, at SCRC, um, you know, something that quite a, quite a large scale collaboration across a variety of different institutions that, that had to be fairly quickly set up. Um, and so uh, really what I you know, want to get to is sort of from basically a project management perspective, you know, what, what were the difficulties in, in getting that set up um, and what were the solutions, uh, you know, especially in the context where the collaborators could be coming from quite disparate uh, expertise backgrounds. So Alice, do you think you could talk on that a little bit and then Richard probably feed in afterwards? Sure. Yeah, I mean, first I'd say that um, from my perspective, there were sort of huge advantages as well as disadvantages to the kind of um, crisis nature of the project and the, the, you know, the dynamic lack of organisation. And in some ways, I think it showed just how far you can get when people are allowed to collaborate really freely without sort of funding constraints and things like this, like, you know, because everyone was a volunteer, there was just whole layers of sort of bureaucracy that weren't there for a start. We all just had our organisation's backings to just go and do what was needed and didn't have to answer to anybody internally in that way. So that was a big advantage, in fact. There was a lot of freedom there to organise the projects how you thought they should be organised, really. Um, when I joined, they already had some quite good structure in place that perhaps Richard will talk about how that came about when he speaks. But at the point where I joined, um, I think the priority for me was to make sure that there were really good um, systems set up before we added large numbers of more volunteers. So that in involved things like how are we going to communicate, just practical stuff, which everybody was doing internally in their own institutions. We just had a month of everybody shifting to home working. So uh, we set up chat systems and uh, GitHub workflows and all the things that you need to, to make it successful. Um, but more than that, I think it's really the, how do you make these, these teams of different experts work together well? And for me, a key thing was to establish a relationship between the model owner, who was largely a, um, a sort of a scientist or modeler who had worked in most cases, I think, on their own on these code bases or with little bits of input from elsewhere, but they were almost entirely the sort of author of this thing. And suddenly they were gonna have a lot of willing volunteers wanting to contribute. Um, so we had to make that manageable. And I, for me, the, um, the best way to do that was to have a really good one-to-one -one relationship first with a lead research software engineer. So I saw my job as to find really good people to do those roles first, which uh, we were really lucky to be able to do. Um, and for them to have at least some time before a lot of other people were added to the project. I mean, we're talking multiple days here, not, <laughs> not a really sufficient amount of time um, to understand the needs of the project, the current situation and put together a bit of a shared plan for what further developers and other experts were going to do when they joined and set up a load of GitHub issues and things like this so that when you suddenly add four more people, you can, you can give them an introduction and give them tasks without every one of them independently having to have a lot of time from the, the lead modeler. So that was one of the key things for me. Perhaps I'll hand over to Richard to... Um, yeah, Richard, go ahead. Yeah. I, the most striking thing for me was how it was how it started. The ver the the very beginning um, was obviously filling out these forms to send to the Royal Society, um, and 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 right at the beginning there was there were there were huge bureaucratic hurdles um, because um, because of confidentiality issues to do with the submissions and things, and then eventually we got hold of fourteen hundred submissions. 
Um, uh, and we basically just had to do free text searches for words that sounded like they might be important and, and desperately trying to work out who all these people were who were volunteering. I mean, the Royal Society did a fantastic job, but they were totally overwhelmed. They, they, they'd had no idea of the scale of the response they were going to get. I think they were expecting kind of 20 or 40 people and they'd be able to like allocate them to different spy M groups and that would be it. Um, but, but, but they allocated kind of two organizations, I think, to spy M in the first instance. Um, uh, one of which was, uh, was the Met Office who volunteered something like 30 RSEs, um, 30 FTEs uh, or something like that. And then, and, and then, and then all of the other 1,399 applicants were there available to, to the other groups. And, and it was really hard to just to just find to find what you were looking for. So it was it was it was a really hard struggle right at the very start. And then we identified uh, UKAA first, um, and then subsequently other groups. And we started getting better ideas about how we what we were looking for. And I think one of the one of the things that we that we perhaps got wrong was that we areas that we didn't have experience of. We didn't know what to look for. So for instance, visualization, RSEs, we knew how important they were and we knew we were desperately short of them. And that's why we identified RSE groups first and went out and, and, and recruited them. But, but, the, but groups like visualization groups who have been fantastic source of support, actually we didn't focus on initially because we weren't really, we, you know, our idea of visualization is mostly doing plots in R, I'm now embarrassed to say. Um, but the, you know, and so we didn't appreciate how much benefit we could gain from these other research areas. Um, and hopefully that will be improved going forward. As far as how we actually managed it, we were really lucky that, as I said at the beginning, we had, um, uh, because we had the Scottish government's kind of equivalent of SPIM for, for animal disease outbreaks, EPIC, um, the, um, they do these um, dummy runs of pandemic uh, emergencies and things regularly and they have a plan in place and so we just implemented their plan so so we were having uh half hour daily meetings with um round table discussions of important points and the whole thing was structured exactly as they would have structured it um had this been uh an actual epic um government advisory uh um event and so so we were really lucky that we were able to take advantage of that and that meant that when we were pulling people in um you know we had a structure around that which allowed us to to coordinate things um yeah yeah no great that that's thanks so uh, sorry that's great um yeah i i guess if there's so two sort of main messages there that i'm, I'm taking is one I, I think both of you had a a focus on on the people so finding the right people obviously was was quite an important thing uh, alice saying there you know getting getting that senior rse kind of paired up with a modeler was quite quite an important step um and then also i guess it's it's the old saying you know don't don't reinvent the wheel there, there were existing resources there for how you should structure the the the, the sort of collaboration uh, and consortium so Hopefully that that's an accurate sort of summary in, in a way, um, right? I, I I think yeah. I'll, I'll move on now to um, I guess what I would say is almost the, the kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, which which is a much smaller scale uh, project uh, that Christopher Woods worked on, which is which is Meta Awards as as he introduced, um, and just getting interested to get you know your uh, perspective on getting your project up and going what what were the difficulties you saw there um and and similarly how did you solve them from a sort of project management perspective yes yeah, so for mess was it's like yeah very much a much much smaller in terms of that initial project i mean from our point of view from what kind of happened is so we had um leon who basically produced his code and produced inputs that were going you know into sage and making predictions that you know there was going to be this peak and we were trying to basically help him and protect him from what we saw happening to other groups. So our initial engagement was, okay, let's quickly review his code and quickly see what needs to be done. Are there any issues with it? And that's when we kind of looked at it and said, okay, there does need to be a lot of engineering work. It's fundamentally sound, but there does need to be a lot of engineering. And then the questions were, how could we engage with him? 
when he is ridiculously busy. So I can't like overemphasize how busy the epidemiologists were at that period of time. Um, I think what the chats that we had, the meetings were these little five or 10 minute meetings that were, we could kind of sneak in. And it was always these meetings where he would be very late or could be canceled at last minute because he was pulled into various briefings, et cetera. And obviously making the code right or the engineering initially looked like not as important. You know, the code worked in their eyes and of course the code does work in their eyes. So it was about then trying to work out how can we work with him to improve the quality of the code where we're not going to slow him down, where we're not going to alienate him. Because obviously as if these codes typically were written by individuals in the Leons, he wrote it entirely himself and he's used it for a decade plus. And it's how do you go in and sort of say, okay, it's good, it works, but it needs to be better. We need to make this a production thing that can actually scale up and deal with the things you're going to be dealing with over the next few months. When you only have 10 minutes to basically talk to him on maybe a week by week basis. And so the way we kind of solved it was basically I, I put myself in the position of being, okay, I know the software, you know the epidemiology, I am going to learn from you that side and then try not to get in your way. Um, so you keep going and then I'll try and feed things back to you, which will help you um, as you're going forwards. So that's why I sat down and I basically tried to learn the entire code base and I learn codes by translating them, which is why I translated the C code into a Python code over a weekend. And then from the translation, I was then able to do all of the unit testing and the validations to show fundamentally the codes were working. At that point, I was then in a position where I could then begin to speak his language. Um, so I knew the terms. I could begin talking about the beta factor or FOIs or things which meant to him. So I was then talking about the code in their language, which then gained the trust that meant that I'm not trying to get in their way. From that point on, I could identify things that needed fixing in the code. I could make the solutions for them and then present them as solutions before the next meeting. Through that process over about a week, it basically a week, week and a half, we were able to then completely rewrite the code and speed it up and do everything that was necessary. And then basically show to him that we were a help. From that point on, he then basically brought us into the epidemiologist Slack channel, he introduced us to other members of the team. And that's when we got involved with them all the discussions of what will we need to model next? So here are the things that governments asked, you know, the code to do going forwards. How could we do this? And it enabled us then, because we've proven ourselves in that initial sort of one week period of translating and speeding up, that we could use this new version and we knew, had ideas of how it could be improved. And then it was basically, when I look back at the change log, that the versions of the code being developed almost sort of daily or two times a week, three times a week, through these very sort of five minute, 10 minute conversations where you're sort of brainstorming things and then go away, implement it and then come back all the time with this thing of being, you not getting in their way. And this was the thing which was really at the, the height of our importance of, we saw how people were trying to sort of attack the epidemiologists, how they were trying to suggest things or make them review things when the epidemiologists were working flat out to model the next stage. So it's all about how could we do things without, without getting in their way, without giving them code that was broken, or without me saying, wait, you have to wait for us to catch up. It was always use your code, we'll then replicate it, and then we'll jump ahead of you and, and sort it out. And ultimately what happened is we ended up, we caught up with what they needed, we then moved ahead of what they needed. And indeed by August, we'd implemented enough in the software that they've only now just caught up in terms of what they need to model with. It was only yesterday that they actually emailed to say, can we do this? And it was like, that will require new code in the software. So it's, it was quite an interesting piece of work. Yeah, it, indeed. Yeah, fascinating. I, I think a, a, a very interesting approach uh, that you took. Uh, and hopefully, yeah, we can, as we continue to go on, dive more into that. Um, yeah, as you... As, as you said, I, I mean, that that uh, that fine line, I think that there's obviously a few things to take out of that, but the, the fine line of respecting what's there, the original solution, um, but then also balancing that with the, the necessary changes uh, in order to make that that code reproducible and, and robust um, is quite a fine line to walk. And, and, and a, I, I imagine, you know, well, I think for, for many probably RSEs, you know, uh, definitely something uh, that takes time to build that trust, um, which I think that this sort of theme of trust is is one that 
uh, you've talked about uh, previously and, and I think is, is really important. Um, I, I'll, I'm going to move now to, the, to our next uh, group. Um, so uh, again, we have, we have sort of an, another, um, uh, not approach, but sort of set up really with uh, Reside and, and the, the extensive modeling experience at Imperial College. Um, so the, the, the question sort of, I guess, shifts a little bit to, you know, with your existing code, codes and, and frameworks, you know, how, how did you adapt to quickly tackle, you know, this sort of very dynamic situation, certainly uh, back in March and, and, and even now? Uh, so perhaps, Rich, can you step in to, to speak a bit about that first? Yes, yeah, sort of a, a big privilege of, of the way that uh, my work is structured is you get to immediately throw new ideas at, at people and find out what works for them and what doesn't work and, and find find out where where things are, are difficult or not. So yeah, we started with a with a with a relatively well, what we thought would be a relatively good set of tools to uh, to work with. We we, we sort of set up a, a modeling pipeline for the last couple of Ebola outbreaks, we've had data coming in and analysis, and we had some dynamical modeling frameworks that, that let people um, write the epidemiology at a really high level, but have it run um, super fast. And then, of course, we found out that uh, that all had to be scaled up just at another whole level due to the demands of the uh, of, of this epidemic. So we, um, it, it's been nice to have that the foundation of work to build on. We didn't start from scratch for anything, but we wrote a ton of of non-epidemiological code uh, in, in, the, in the process of, of doing so. Just things that you, you, you wouldn't necessarily think about, like the problem of if you've got enough data coming in that it keeps two or three people occupied just cleaning it and collecting it, how do you make sure that the 15 or 20 researchers who are trying to build models based on that data, how do, how do you how do you get them the most recent copy of the data and how do you let them choose when they sort of fold in? Um, the new versions of the data sets. And so we had, we had some um, workflow software that we had developed for a completely different project that we, that we uh, rolled out to use for that. And similarly with the, um, with the dynamical modeling, you know, I'd, I'd spent a bunch of time uh, three years ago working with some malaria models for creating sort of SIR models that, that, that are so popular with this sort of work. And they were very happy to work in continuous time with deterministic models. And that was apparently not gonna fly with COVID stuff. So. We just had this really basic implementation of uh, an engine for running a stochastic model that had the same sort of high level dimensional language that sat, sat on top of it. Um, about God, was it June or something, uh, we just looked at it and was like, this isn't going to work anymore. We need, we need to. So we rewrote the whole back end um, of that publisher. And that near, we got some nice new tools. But with, the nice thing about how we work and the relationship we had with the epidemiologists is that I could say, look, I'm just going to take a month and rewrite. The back of this you guys just keep on going um and then we could just fold that in and they get all of a sudden things ran you know 10 times faster on the cluster than they did before uh, so it's, it's been a, it's been an interesting mix of of reusing tools reusing frameworks but also just sort of building on the on the relationships that that um i had the privilege to to develop over the past few years in the department great and uh, yeah just in some of our previous discussions um you mentioned that you know there were certain parts um, of of sort of previous modeling efforts that you thought would be really important, you know, drawing on your previous uh, experience. But then it turns out that those weren't so important. I, I thought that was quite sort of an interesting um, observation or or experience. Do, do you could you just expand on that, perhaps? Yeah, the, the one that jumps to mind would be um, so when I first joined the department. It was at the end of the West African. A Ebola outbreak, and I sat down with some of the epidemiologists, and they were showing me the problems that they'd fought with. And the, one of the big problems that that, uh, that that caused them the most amount of grief was was just cleaning the the names of things. Uh, so they showed me a data set with 127 different spellings of Sierra Leone, um, which is sort of an impressive ability to misspell. So so we we'd sketched out a couple of times in the last. A few years, some some tools to help with doing that sort of clean up, and that had come in useful in the, in the previous uh, in, in the DRC Ebola outbreaks. But we'd never sort of got those production ready. And when this thing rolled around, I was like, "Oh no, we're gonna, you know, I'm going to really regret that we hadn't spent the time in, to to do that." But it turns out that 
you know, probably because we're dealing, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an epidemic where it's just in English and it's in this in this country and all the data is coming in electronically and the, you know the people who are collecting the data aren't literally dying while they collect it. Um, it's it, that just hadn't ended up um, being the, 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 the place where where the stress was was found in terms of the data cleaning, the data cleaning ended up just being able to use a lot of off the shelf tools. So. Uh, it's a place that we could have sunk a lot of time. Probably would come in useful in, a, in another outbreak, but it sort of shows that you know, having a having a set of, of of tools on the shelf that you can you can grab is important, but you, you're never going to know which which handful are going to be the key ones. Yeah, actually, that that sort of preempts my my next question, which was, yeah, is there any way of predicting what what are going to be the important things? But it's going to depend very much on the particular uh, in instance. Yeah. Thought so. Um, yeah, Lilith, I, I wonder if we could get you sort of in on this as well, more so pro perhaps from, you know, sort of the modeling modeler perspective, um, you know, in, in terms of making that pivot, pivot uh, you know, what were the sort of, I guess, demands and, and how did you deal with them? Uh, you know, and, and obviously it, within the context of the RSC community, we're, we're, we're considered, you know, we're kind of concerned about, you know, writing the software and writing the models that you're doing, what, what were the sort of challenges that you encountered and, and how did you overcome that? So um, for me, it wasn't really necessarily the pivot between diseases that was an issue. And also one thing that was made easy was the fact that we do have an embedded RSE in the form of Rich and his team in the department was, I'd actually been working with a lot of these modeling frameworks that Rich is describing for a, a number of years. I'd used them for other diseases, a lot of the stuff that Rich had built. So that was all very familiar um, and we've taught using those tools as well. So it's all kind of, all that kind of, embedding and pre-work had led to the, for the whole um, system to be pretty responsive when it came, came to dealing with the pandemic. Um, things that were a really big pivot for me, and I'm sure um, just to echo a couple of things that other people have been saying as well, was um, when you're working as a researcher working on smaller projects, and I'm not used to working on outbreak analysis, so it tends to be my code base that I'm developing generally on my own. Occasionally I'll take over someone else's code base, but not remotely the same level of collaborative working that we've had to do in the pandemic. So um, while I used Git for version control, I didn't use um, like I, I was not uh, used to doing pull requests and code reviews and all of that. And also um, having a robust system of unit testing that um, we've all um, got up to speed with super quickly. So that was the huge, and also the, the version control system that Rich was talking about and the framework that we've been using for that. Um, that was the biggest learning curve uh, for me with this pivot. And uh, yeah, it's learning all of those habits has been absolutely invaluable. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, great. So, so I guess probably, yeah. I mean, continuing really along um, that vein, um, you know, I, I guess what what is and and you know, you've already sort of touched on this a bit, but you know, the the sort of researcher or modeler perception of of the RSC involvement, um, you know, upon this modeling process, you know, and and I guess to put it more bluntly you know, did you find RSCs helpful? I, I think the answer is probably yes, but you know, in what, in what ways? Uh, so I guess, yeah, Lilith, if you wanna maybe just expand on that a bit and then Richard, we can get you in on that as well. Sure, I mean, it, like Rich has been absolutely integral and just critical to the whole effort, frankly. Um, so um, some of the things that we've touched on as well, like um, the, um, well, the fact that we've been doing stochastic modeling means that we need it to be reproducible with stochastic seeds um, things like that. So having this um, kind of uh, modular framework of code whereby, because we're doing so much, and there's so many different researchers using different outputs from various stages of the modeling process. So Rich has spoken about the data coming in, which then may be used by 15 different groups. Um, but then we'll be running um, stochastic fits um, in the UK every on various different dates. And then those model fits will then go on to be used by different people to do different analyses. So having that framework kind of available where everybody can have perfectly um, referenced versions of everything, get most up to date that are easy to access from a centralized server whenever you need them. Yeah, that we wouldn't be able to do anything that we are, that we can with that. And we also, because we're producing reports so frequently, um, which have to be um, 
completely reproducible with completely transparent code that's all unit tested having this um, framework where we can we have the exact code that was run on any date um, with references to the report that it produced so we can we have a full paper trail all the way back to the all the way back to the the data and the assumptions so uh, yeah we it's absolutely integral basically yeah certainly um richard do, do you want to come in on on that at all um Yes, I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, the RSCs were completely critical. We, we uh, as I said right at the start, when when we met up um, a few groups um, in in uh, a few Scottish groups met up in in early March to discuss whether there was stuff that we could do. We decided that we just didn't have the RSC resources to do it. So it was clear from the start that the the from our animal disease kind of uh, haven over in the corner, the the, the models were going to be so dramatically different. Um, the, the, the without significant RSE input, then then we weren't going to get to a point where the models were going to be useful in any in any sensible amount of time, um, and and so and and so that was completely critical, and and we and we kind of made a, a decision at the point at which this all kicked off with Ramp that that um, we didn't want to be kind of backseat drivers in this process chipping in unhelpfully about what our model said without you know with kind of intermediate model results and so one of the things that we had a bit of time to do was to implement the kind of stuff that Lilith is talking about of of um of traceability of of data products and following them through the um the, the the system so we could say that exactly you know this model output this 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 product that came out the end we can we can trace it back through a data registry through to the model through to the data sources that were used to generate that 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 data and then um, and then the the, the uh, git commit that was run on the um, for the code that was used to to do that and all of that integrates together in in a, in a permanent record of that of that data out of that model output so that we could you know we wanted to make sure that if we were going to be contributing something that we the the that we weren't going to be making it up that we that because this is a lot of stuff that we talked about or the the groups that do the the animal disease modeling advice had talked about uh previously but it had been very difficult um to persuade anyone to fund it um and i think this is probably a recurring theme that 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 the that, that yes, it would be great to have uh, to, for you to employ an RSE to do this, but unfortunately, we basically have a choice here. You can either employ an epidemiologist or you can employ an RSE, but not both. Um, uh, and uh, and and those decisions, for obvious reasons, uh, in epidemiology groups, nearly always came down in favour of the epidemiologist. So so yeah, I mean the RSEs have been completely critical in getting all of this this infrastructure in place to do the unit testing, to do traceability and provenance of data and provenance of model outputs and all this kind of stuff has been absolutely amazing transformation of the epidemiological modeling that we were doing going into the pandemic. Great, yeah, so uh, pretty, pretty clear message there about versioning, reproducibility, getting these frameworks and, and pipelines set up. That's, uh... Yeah, very, very interesting to hear. Um, I'll open that up perhaps to um, anyone else on the panel, this, this question about sort of the, what did you see as the, the impact of RSC involvement, if anyone is, is keen to step in on that. Perhaps Chris, could you per maybe talk to that a bit? Well, it would be really echoing really what's been said. So I mean, yeah. the, the big, when we originally got the, uh, the C version of the MetaWards code, um, you had things like hard-coded parameters, hard-coded bits of data, and you could see they were editing the source code to edit the parameters and recompile and rerun. So there was no culture of reproducibility or traceability of the data. And, you know, now it's completely different. It's sort of, they understand, you know, there is this thing now, you can track to source commits, they understand why you need to have that traceability and reproducibility. And even with, this is a stochastic model as well, how you put in things like your random number seeds, managing numbers of processes so that you can always reproduce the results you're getting. And then in terms of RSE, I think one of the big changes, um, and I hope this becomes more concrete change, is that they saw the value of RSE. So obviously through the pandemic, a large number of grants opened up for epidemiologists to begin to get funding for their work. And the groups I was working with then began automatically adding on RSEs and data managers to the project. So they were almost like 
kicking back against the funding councils and saying, look, to do this project, you need to have an RSC, you need to have a data manager. And what I'm hoping is that as we move forward, it was very clear. Um, so in my, one of my other roles is I sit on one of the, the infrastructure sat for EPSRC and so I had a lot of feedback into UKRI on these things. And UKRI and EPSRC were seeing how the research community and this concept of having research teams coming together with different skills was really valuable. And it was really impressive how the RSC community and the data science community were really working closely with researchers. So I think the long term impact of this really is going to be that the myth that you would hire one postdoc to do everything on a research project and that's sustainable. I think that myth has been shattered this year. And what I hope we'll see moving forward through the 2020s is that idea that if you're going to create a research project, you will now make sure it's properly staffed. And it's not credible to, to not do that, because ultimately, if you don't have your software in place, if your data isn't clean, if the results you produce aren't reproducible, then it's difficult to trust the outputs of that piece of work. And from a you know, public spending point of view, it's a waste of public money. So that's where I hope we'll end up. And I, and I think that's been proven this year. And I think we need to shout that, you know, once this is over, we need to really highlight that to everybody. Mm, yeah, in, indeed. And and good to hear that that minds are changing. I, I think lots of people are seeing that in many different areas. But um, yeah, no, certainly good to hear, you know, concrete stories of, of that happening. Um, I think since we're, we are uh, ticking along here, uh, I'll, I'm going to switch over to the uh, audience questions now. And, and I'll ask panelists if, if you do have your uh, Slido window open, if you could start tagging things. But um, I guess I'll just start pulling off uh, probably the, the top question that we have so far here. Um, so it is, what lessons could be leveraged in more normal times, or you wish were already in place, to share knowledge within the RSE space and between RSEs and re researchers? Um, Alice, do, do you want to take that one uh, first, and, and we can see if anyone else wants to uh, answer. Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I find myself already kind of referring to the, the example of how these projects work when setting up new projects in my sort of day job and this kind of thing as examples of how um, it is really key from the outset when you're proposing new research projects that you really think about what all those different skills are, how you're going to make up that research team that you don't always have to follow that sort of traditional model of there being sort of, you know, one researcher within the domain who may or may not be able to sort of call on support services that they'll sort of figure out later but that in an ideal world you would actually be able to think from the start about what are the skills we need and how can we have those represented within the team. Um, I think in terms of what the RSEs learned from it I'm just going to share a link to some somewhere where we've documented some of this. Um, in terms of I mean this is a checklist that we sort of used. So there were these six different modeling teams, each of which had a lead RSE, and those people got together and tried to kind of write down um, what does it mean to them for the software to be in a, a good state, for the results to be trustworthy from the point of view of software correctness and this kind of thing. And none of, nothing on there is going to be a sort of big surprise to anybody who works in this area. We're not saying it's, you know, brand new information, but. Um, it's kind of like what we felt was a reasonable interpretation of all the good things we try to do as RSEs in such a situation. You know, it's a sort of practical interpretation of what do we mean by readiness. So it's things like automated testing and it's things like um, reproducibility and getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty of what we mean by that, you know, being able to reproduce a model run and get, you know, scientifically consistent results basically and this kind of thing and what you actually have to do to achieve that. So we've sort of released that checklist as a Creative Commons thing just now, really. We haven't really shown it to anyone yet, but we'd be really interested if, if other RSEs with similar sets of experience, you know, wanted to chip in and have a conversation about that. Um, and then finally, in terms of embedding all of those things, I think one, one huge lesson is that um, it's no good if some RSEs come in and do things to a code for somebody else and then they're unable to continue to work with that. So it has to be like a genuine collaborative team effort all the way along so that the, the people who are going to long term be working with and further developing and using that code 
fully understand and are on board with any changes that happen and any new systems that are put in place. And it's not something that just an RSE came in and did, and then it sits over there in the corner because nobody really knows what to do with it later. Yeah, no, re really good points. And, and I mean, I, so, sort of this question in a way gets to the, the heart of why we're having this, this panel discussion in many ways is, is to try to communicate, yeah, what, what were the lessons learned um, from the, the sort of software or the research software engineering perspective, um, but not just on the technical side, on, on the sort of project management side, as, as you mentioned as well, and, and how do we compose these teams to work on things and ensure that there's good communication and longevity of, of the things that are produced. Um, I, I don't know if does anyone else, I, I don't want to throw this out too broadly, but does anyone else want to, you know, give, give a quick one or two things that, that they learn during this that they want to, you know, really, really hit home uh, in terms of what, what should RSEs and their normal operation be, be trying to, to take on board? Okay, uh, I can just quickly. Yeah, go just, ahead, Chris. Just echo. I think, I think Alice is very right in that it could not be that RSEs swan in, they do some work and they disappear and they disenfranchise the model owners. Um, and that was one of our biggest fears. And, and making that switch from C to Python was that was the biggest thing we were worried about when we started. Um, it was like, should we, should we do this? Should we risk disenfranchising? And that's why we very strongly adopted that approach of design by tutorial. So it was very much, how do we write tutorials on how you'll use it before we write the software and really thinking about the use of the software from that kind of user modeler point of view. And then we then switched to adopting a plugin based architecture for the software where effectively the tutorials were teaching you how to write plugins to do the things you wanted to do. And that then sort of helped to bring in the learning of how you would write clean Python. And so, while originally it was looking like that design budget tool might have been a very long process or slower to do than most work, actually we found that really helped um, build a strong collaboration and build the trust and also ensure that the group then took it over. It's why, while my engagements with the project were very heavy from March to August, from August onwards, they were always able to use the tutorials. And so my engagements have been actually very, very light from there. And so that's something that I would carry forward as a legacy that that kind of approach of design by tutorial is extremely productive for an RSE relationship with researchers. Yes, certainly. I, I can, uh, having read a bit on, on your approach, Christopher, and on, on that project, the, the tutorial-led development is certainly something that I haven't tried myself, but it looks incredibly compelling and, and is definitely something I, I would uh, encourage others to, to read up on. Uh, Rich, I, I see that you have your, your microphone unmuted there, so if you want to uh, perhaps jump in. I was going to echo, echo that as well. I think it's important, like, if you've got RSCs who are non, RSCs exist on the spectrum, right? You've got people, in most contexts, Lilith would be considered to be a research software engineer, right? She's a researcher writing software, um, according, you know, from, from, the, from the broader definitions within, you know, within, within the society that that's an RSC, and then you have people like Chris and myself and Alice, uh, who are non-domain experts. I have no background in epidemiology, I'm just here to write right code and so from my point of view in a department you know we've, we've got a group of us um i think we're eight at the moment um a group of fluxes here it's important that from my point of view that we don't become a parasite on the department right we we are, we are there to help the, the epidemiologists do their epidemiology most effectively and you it, it can't be that you you build up a dependent relationship where they have to come to you you have to be um sort of teaching to fish rather than rather than fishing, doing the things that, 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 that the epidemiologists couldn't do. So a good chunk of what our group does is, is, is sort of taking research and getting it on the web, getting, getting it behind a web app, something that no epidemiologist should ever have to think about. And if for some reason they want to spend a bunch of time on the weekend doing that, doing that sort of stuff. But from a lot of what was important in this pandemic, um, the, the researchers I'm working with, I'd expect that uh, when they sort of grab these tools and use them in their own projects, they won't come to asking them any more than the most basic questions about using it because it's it's sort of tooling designed with 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 them in mind that, that cap that tries to capture their problem. I think yeah as much as possible like research software engineers shouldn't be coming and saying I'm here to rescue you because the same the same um the same could be said of the statisticians like our all of our work fitting fitting codes um, fitting fitting the results of the model to data 
is as dependent on the statistical soundness as it is on on the, on the computational soundness. It's, it's, it, and it is all these other sort of adjacent fields. It's very, it's very easy to sort of look at a piece of software engineering and say that doesn't look like a static site sim, static site generator like I just wrote. Uh, and it's seeing seeing the faults in it, but, the, but there's all these other adjacent parts that sort of modern multidisciplinary research touches on. And I think we need to make sure that we don't just focus on the bits that are easy to uh, to, to to point out, like like the software engineering. Yeah, no, very very good point. Um, certainly, to to take that sort of broader perspective on things, not not to narrow in on our our own sort of interests. I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, I think we'll go to, uh, let's see, just, just checking the questions here. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, okay, so the top one at the moment is, is uh, I think, a pretty good one. So will the modeling work have a long-term legacy of greater multi multidisciplinary collaboration between different institutes? Uh, what action is needed to cement this? Um, I think that's, uh, probably everyone can speak to that, but may maybe we'll go back to, start off with the, the sort of SCRC um, side of things, Richard or Alice, if you, if you want to pick that up. Sure, yeah, I could um, talk about that. So our center was originally set up with exactly this in mind. We're, we, we were originally, and I say originally, it was only 12 years ago or something, we were a center that, to try to join two faculties inside our, our university. Um, and then we expanded out from there into into trying to trying to connect interdisciplinary research across different institutions uh, more broadly. And um, I think that that the, that worked very well. And this and, and that's really helped with 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 taking this forward. But actually, you know, one of the problems that we've come up against that undoubtedly um, will will come back in a year or two when everyone's mysteriously forgotten uh, about COVID is 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 actually funding for it so i mean it's fine today that then certainly last year that there were lots of people volunteering and that was all fantastic and and it and uh, you know it overcame an enormous number of administrative barriers um as well as um as well as actually producing lots of really good work um but 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 fundamentally um making the keeping these interdisciplinary linkages going requires funding just as RSEs themselves require funding and and you know in the case of the interdisciplinary linkages it's probably not that much money but you know we we generally apply for a few thousand pounds for various different resources every year to organize kind of small conferences and things like that I and mean, we haven't had time to do anything like that in the last year but the you know but but this kind of thing just to keep the linkages alive so that these new linkages that we've made to more RSE groups to visualization groups to to um, to other groups in the medical more in the medical communities that we've um, sometimes struggled to link into before possibly mostly because of most of our works on animal diseases but the you know the, but 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 that does require kind of core funding to maintain the links and i think that's going to be i think that, that absolutely um it will have a, a long-term legacy um and we're already seeing that in some of the work that we're now doing to take this forward but the um but but i think to cement it does require um research councils to support it in the future because i mean you know when i started doing interdisciplinary research in 2000 we had double jeopardy with grant proposals that you we applied to bbsrc and epsrc or circ as it was and and if it wasn't approved by both research councils the grant was rejected um and and so things have got a lot better but there's still much further to go uh, alice do you want to jump in on that too yeah just quickly i really just wanted to emphasize that you know whilst we're talking mainly about RSEs and that collaboration here that it's so directly analogous to all these other disciplines and in SCRC we did have these amazing visualization teams and these people who were um, specializing in statistics and things like that and doing inference and adding it to models where they were not doing that before um, and data specialists who were processing data and working out the data workflows and how that ought to look and um, it's really just a much more general lesson than just RSE collaborations. And also that we had um, people from universities and from industry. So we had people volunteering from places like the Mann Group who were 
doing you know they were very and once where they were working together on teams they were very similar you know very similar types of people that could have been in an RSC group in a university but they were doing financial modeling and you know applying their statistics over there and this kind of thing it's it was really very similar and people from Invenia working on the Julia models and things like this um, and so that that was very powerful and I think they really liked to have that opportunity as well to work on something research related and maybe there are more more chances where we could do that but I think the, the funding issues just get you know, completely multiplied when you start to think about that but uh, it's, it's definitely worth thinking about but I think one of the most powerful things is just the personal experience of all the people involved knowing what, what that can do for you and that you know you do have to solve the funding issues but more people I think will then be motivated to try to do that in future projects. Yeah indeed. Um... Right, gonna move on to sort of another topic. Um, I, I think this one probably targeted at uh, Lilith or, or Rich. Uh, we have a question, what, what's the, the variation in scale between the different models? Uh, this could be in terms of size of code base, compute resources required. Um, and is it always the case that larger complex models uh, always produce better results? So uh, Lilith, are you, you you okay to answer that? Well, I, I will defer to Rich on the on the okay. stats. I'm not. A... <laughs> I think you've probably looked at it most recently, haven't you, Rich? Yeah, I think that the last part you should definitely do. I'll leave that. I'll... Yeah, I can do the last part. So yeah. the larger models necessarily. I mean, no, not necessarily. However. Um, it depends what you mean in terms of complexity. So a lot of the complexity that we've had to add has been to like, um, the, the situation evolves incredibly quickly and the questions that you're asked involve, uh, evolve incredibly quickly, such as, uh, does your model have vaccination in? Um, we need to kind of pull that all the way through in all the different ways that um, COVID vaccination might impact the, the transmission dynamics um, and all the uncertainties and stuff. So not necessarily better results. Um, dep it depends on the question that you're asking, basically. You need a model that is tailored to the question that you're asking. And if you're asking a complex question, then your model needs to have the capabilities to answer that, um, which is why we have many of them, um, varying from the kind of incredibly detailed individual simulation models all the way through to kind of ones that can be used in lower and middle income countries where um to kind of do broad brush um simulations and things like that so that would be my uh take on that part but i will hand over to rich for the uh comparative sizes <laughs> question so, so, so within, within the models uh in our department it is like that said largely driven by the data availability so we're where the um, sort of these low and middle income, low and middle income country models uh, mostly fit to public data that is common across all countries in, in the world. So it's like ECDC data set and a couple of other things. Um, there's, there's no point having a super complicated model because there's not that many, there's not many, not many, not, ma not much data to bend it around. So those, those models are tiny. They can run in JavaScript in your web browser. Uh, they're 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 small. Um, and so these are the same sort of um, compartmental models that that our, our big models are, are based on um, with the difference being sort of the number of types of compartments and how the compartments are structured so at the beginning of the epidemic uh, we had maybe a hundred compartments a sort of sir divided into age divided into uh like if you're in hospital or not and then as as the epidemiology demanded we sort of um combinatorically added um layers to that so the s uh, you've got split by how have a vaccine you've got and where you are in your vaccine progression. We have um, different uh, these progression parameters. I've got no idea what, what these are about. It's come out of some work that Bob Verity did for, for progression to the hospital system. So everything's structured by those. As we've uh, got this uh, new variant, that's added um, uh, additional layers and these things sort of grow. So rather than having scalar S, I, and R, I've been pushing around, you've got these sort of tensors that are moving through. And every transition between those, involves some sort of uh, stochastic um, stochastic process. So these these things grew from, from models that you can comfortably run on your laptop to ones that take um, they take a number of hours to run overnight on our um, on our on our, on our in-house cluster. Uh, and we just we just sort of scale as 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 dictated by the epidemiology. We've got a, we've got a project to try and get these running on the on the on GPUs. Uh, we can work with some folks in the video for that, which is a good one. Um, but I think the thing that's, that you, you don't see in the, in sort of a, a blind analysis of how much code is there is is how much that uh, 
of the sort of just the completely normal non sort of non RSE type uh, epidemiology is going on like every day. Uh, all the epidemiologists get together and they just sort of stare at the fits for an hour and say, "What are we fitting well? What are we not fitting well? What doesn't the model have in it?" And then that sort of creates a list of of, of how it gets expanded. So it's, it's not you don't start off with some sort of universally large large model. In terms of um, like the straight up code side, so we've tried to structure things so that the actual code that the epidemiologists have written for for our um, sort of our, our big models only it's, it's something on the order of about 1500 lines of, of our code uh, which then compiles out to some large amount of, of c++ um, but that that's all that sits on top of tens of thousands of lines of, of every such code that we've developed and is all um, got its test suites and stuff i think within the model though uh, the epidemiologists have written twice as many lines of code now as, as te uh, in tests as I have an implementation, which is something that I'm particularly pleased about. Uh, it's been a huge, huge shift there. We're very well trained now. <laughs> no, that, that's very impressive and, and, and good to hear. Good to hear. Uh, I think I'll, uh, any RSE would be uh, happy to have that, that sort of stat associated with project they're working on. Um, Great. I, I don't know if the, the sort of our, our SCRC people want to, to comment on this at all, just in terms of sizes of any of the codes they were working with, just a quick quick recap or or if it's okay if we move on. I mean, it's a very similar answer to Rich. I mean, yeah. our, our code bases, our, our, our code bases are, are relatively small, but the computational time, we get these exactly the same combinatorial explosions of of a uh, number of compartments in the models and and the and the resolution of the of the spatial resolution that we're operating on as well and and once you once you have a very high spatial resolution and lots of compartments then it's very very slow unless you're running it on hpc sure yeah um okay uh that's great looking up to the the next question um so someone says it was interesting to hear chris's approach to gaining trust uh, do the panel have examples of approaches that do or don't work uh, based on experience? So I guess I'll pass that to Chris in, in the first instance. Uh, I mean, he's given, I think, one example, but maybe some that he knows of that don't work. Uh, yeah, Chris, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we got to this through a trial and error from a number of years working where basically there are lots of things that didn't work. So I won't name specifically the projects that didn't work, um, but generally what happens is it's when you when you come in as where you're superior to the research you're working with I think you have to put yourself in a position where you're going to learn from them so when we came in if you come in as a superior I'm a software engineer I know what I'm doing your code is not very good I'm going to take it away from you I'm going to do stuff to it and then I'm going to give it back to you and you will use it because it is now brilliant that approach doesn't work because no matter how good the code is you've, you've got at that point, you've lost the person in the first week of the interaction and they'll continue to use their existing code because there is nothing wrong with their existing code. And I think approaches which don't acknowledge that the existing code is working and the existing way of working is working. And you know those approaches are basically always doomed to failure. So you've got to go in as, a, as an inferior, as a, I'm learning from you, your code works, but now let's see how we can make things better. Yeah, no, very, very good points. Um, do either either Lilith or Rich maybe want to sort of step in on that in, in, in terms of the dynamics that that might go on in, in your department? I guess I guess the relationship has been, you know, built up over quite a long time. So so perhaps the the preliminaries are over, are already there, but are there you know, things that may be a higher level that, that you encounter uh, in terms of this sort of issue of trust. I think, I think the proven track record speaks for itself with, with this. We all just, we all know that Rich's tools work and work beautifully. And he has spent so much time getting feedback from everybody about how the, um, all of this, the frameworks should be designed that, um, yeah, it, it's never the yeah the, the question of trust is already there for all of us, I think. Um, and I do appreciate the um, the similar approach of kind of not coming in and rubbishing everybody's code, which does probably set things up on a bad foot. But um, yeah, you're very diplomatic. <laughs> I find this after a while you you sort of seeing all of all of the chunky code that you're going to see it all sort of looks more or less the same. I think 
a bigger barrier is whether or not people will adopt um, the workflows at uni. Like, in terms of sussing out whether or not a collaboration is going to work out, a lot of it boils down to can we get you using Git? Can we sort of establish a, a sort of a common truth that will work against for your code, regardless of how the code looks, regardless of what is implemented and, and regardless of what we're going to do? Uh, some of those workflow features are way more important than, than, uh, than any of the, of the details of the code. And, um, it's been difficult to build. You know, we have a lot of people in the department, they work a lot of different ways and I have varying degrees of interaction with them. Uh, and it's it's typically been the ones you can sort of come on board with with a number of those workflow things. That's been the biggest predictor of whether or not we'll, we'll work closely together on a thing. And that's, I think that just reflects the day-to-day -day difficulty of, of working off code that's stored you know, on Dropbox or on their network drive or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, interesting. Uh, Alice or, or Richard, any any sort of comments on that? That sort of key trust between RSEs and, and researchers. Yeah, I mean, I'd say in general, there's so many factors that go into that, and it is at the end of the day a relationship between people. And so, you can try all these things, but it will come down to that dynamic between people sometimes. And there's always going to be a sort of variety of levels of engagement and a variety of levels of success in different collaborations. You can't 100% prevent that, whatever you do, I think. Um, it was interesting in this experience that actually for people in, in my team who were used to working within one domain in physics, um, actually working in a, a domain we were unfamiliar with, um, it, it, sometimes it's almost easier to find that engagement initially because um, a lot of physicists are, are quite accustomed to writing their own software and uh, you know when the, the when there's a sort of very clear difference in expertise and clearly different roles in the team and that gap is farther apart everybody kind of understands their role a lot better whereas actually if you're closer together and you're a, a physicist who write code versus a, an RSE who used to be a physicist it's actually like you're both a lot closer in skill set sometimes so sometimes that bigger gap can can make for more clarity and more more engagement with, without everyone having to work out their roles on the job. Yeah, in, indeed. I just uh, nodding my head and understanding at that. So it's certainly uh, applicable for me. Um, uh, Richard, any anything anything to add from from your side? Um, no, not really. I mean, I think everyone. I think pretty much everything's been covered. I, the, the, I suppose the only. I think we still we still struggle a bit with some of the with some of the work. I mean, we said that mostly epidemiologists work alone and um, uh, you know with their own code, and and I think in some on some occasions that can have gone on for too long. Perhaps that they're too entrenched, and so so you can get in a situation where an individual epidemiologist perhaps is is too too used to their own way of working and just can't bring themselves to to lose what they see as their productivity which well which is their productivity um uh you know by engaging with somebody else's processes and uh, and i think that i don't know there's necessarily a solution to that that i think that that if you have been working on your own with your own code in your own way for so many years it can just be possibly impossible to break out of that yeah, I think in normal circumstances, that would be a process of building trust and bringing people in very gradually over a long period of time, not sort of throwing a lot of people at someone. So in that kind of fast moving situation, the ones that were starting from less existing code were, had an advantage in, in terms of how do you collaborate. Great. Uh, so yeah, really, really good discussion there on on the, the topic of trust. Um, so uh, go on to the next question here, which will probably be the last one that, that we get to. Um, so uh, qu question here specifically about um, how big a problem was it to figure out, set up environments to run the existing modeling software that was uh, used as a starting point. Uh, they say disp dependencies, et cetera. Um, I imagine this might be more so relevant to to perhaps Christopher and maybe Alice and Richard. Uh, Chris, do you want to do you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah, it was um, quite a challenge because again, I want to emphasize me having to ask them how do you get your code working and could you give me input files was interrupting them. So very much is they had a, a data dump on GitHub, and so it was I had to just figure it out and just very strange ways, um, not wishing to attack them, but things like 
they would use main files and edit the main file. And then there was a compiled O.O file that you would then work out had to be linked to it. And they didn't pass command line options because they never learned how to write command line option parsers. So you ended up with this weird thing and it was like just spending about half a day just making it not crash. And then after half a day of not crash, figuring out, okay, what could these variables possibly mean? What could these inputs do? And just trying to just ignite an epidemic. So many times when you when it was then running, how do you get an epidemic to actually last for more than a day? Because it would die out because there were obviously parameter ranges, which had no idea what the parameters were because there was no documentation whatsoever. Um, and so it was, it was a really big problem. In terms of the environment and dependencies, they weren't too bad because uh, my experience with academics is they tend not to use dependencies much they tend to like to write everything themselves and in this case they had written everything themselves in this massive 1500 line c program and so it was actually then trying to break down what those bits were and then try and pull put dependencies into it so it's almost like the inverse of that so replacing things they'd handwritten with things that already exist that would that potentially do a bigger job um so yeah it was it was a really hard bit of work that was basically the weekend of my birthday and uh, I kind of found it ironic because it was my 42nd birthday I'm a big hitchhikers fan and so it was almost like 42 that's the meaning of life going through a researcher's code and trying to figure out how it works and uh, yeah that's what RSCs I think should do it's it's, it's part of the job <laughs> quite quite the birthday present right um is there does anyone else want to to add anything on that I don't know if the the SCRC has uh anything particular about sort of dependencies, managing dependencies, I, I can imagine that that was something that that came up. Uh, so Richard or Alice. Um, it's hard to generalize really, because these are six models written in four different languages, very different code bases. So it, that was really part of that job that those initial lead RSEs had to tackle working together with the researcher. Um, so for instance, you know, there were two in C++ and one in Python or, you know, Java models and Julia. So exactly the details of how you manage dependencies and things will have varied hugely. Um, in some cases, there were efforts made around sort of packaging and containerization, and we had access to Dirac HPC. So there were some efforts to make it run on there, which I think, you know, there were things to tweak, but I don't think there were there were huge issues with doing that. Um, apart from that, I think which has already alluded to the, the really large amounts of work. There was a sort of real top level decision that everything ought to be accessing its data through this data pipeline. So I think that was probably the biggest amount of work was pulling things that might have been hard coded or might have been in, handled in various different ways through various different kinds of input file, pulling them into a sort of more of a uniform form and taking them through this data pipeline. That, that was large amounts of environment type work. Thanks, Alice. Um, yeah, so maybe, okay, perhaps this might be a good, a good one to, to finish on, uh, and maybe just a, a very quick, hopefully a, a quick response, but uh, asking what would you do differently if slash when the, the next pandemic comes along? Uh, so maybe I'll start, start with Rich on that one. To me, uh, I would probably try to get more sleep early uh, and not <laughs> underestimate how long this is going to run for. Uh, it's just been such a slog. Um, no, I, to, be, to be honest, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with, our, with our response. I think uh, sort of we, we, we chucked a bunch of time in early to get sort of a, a, a grand level of training on people. And then uh, I think the tool that's come out of it is, is really surprisingly in, in, in great shape. Um, sort of, yeah, feels a bit, a bit odd. I think it's too late for any real post mortems, but I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm pretty happy with 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 our response at this point. It's good, good to hear, uh, Lilith. Any anything you would you would do differently? Um, I would echo the sleeping in advance, um, and um, yeah, I think um, just the importance of um I don't, yeah the marathon not a sprint and just realizing that the importance of once you've pushed to get something out coming back and like really make going over that again and making sure that you everything is in working order for you to pick it back up again when that's going to need to happen which is probably going to be pretty soon so that's that's been learned the hard way a couple of times so uh yeah <laughs> sure certainly 
Uh, Richard, do you have anything you do differently? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it, it's been very interesting kind of this time around not being on the front line. Um, and I, and I can easily imagine the sleep uh, problems. I mean, the, the 2001, 2007 foot mat disease outbreaks were ones that we were heavily involved in and, and, you know, and, and there were similar problems. Everyone, yeah, I don't think anyone anticipated the 2001 outbreak would go on as long as it did. Um, and everyone was very relieved when it when it didn't in 2007. But we say, what, what will we do differently when the next pandemic comes? I mean, we had to reallocate resources back away from this because there's bird flu in England at the moment. You don't hear much about it, um, <laughs> but but it's going on. Uh, you know, it's just constant waves. People unfortunately live in this dream world where um, where it's a where where there's an if in that question. Um, um, you know, when in fact it's just one thing after another, after another, after another, and some of them you're you're committed to for unbelievable lengths of time, like uh, Rich and Lilith are at the moment, and Chris as well, and some of them um, are happily over quite quickly, and it it will, it's it, it's really it's it's really hard to to anticipate what's different you know we we were quite naive i think going in once we had the resources we were quite naive going in about exactly how different humans are from animals um i mean apart from the fact that you you um ideally choose not to uh cull them uh if they get sick um uh the um you uh you know just how they move i mean we have so such good data so many of our models what the things that we had to do to them were to degrade them unbelievably to deal with humans because we had no idea you know we we, we had to say well okay so we want to do track and trace well great we have all this stuff implemented for animal animal diseases we know how track and trace works and it's like well do you have a model where track and trace totally fails um, and you, you, you don't see any of the contacts, you don't see any of the people, you get it all wrong all the time. It's like, no, we don't have that model because, because track and trace works for animals. <laughs> uh, <you know? laughs> so there's all sorts of things that, that you know, thinking about how, how, how different the scenario is that you're dealing with from the one you expected to deal with. Um, so I don't think that really answers the question. No, no worries, no worries. Uh, <laughs> Alice, any anything you do differently? Um, I have no idea whether I would or wouldn't be likely to be involved in anything similar in a future pandemic. But I mean, the hope is that a lot of as that this kind of like almost like the shadow team that Rich has been describing, you know, where we had the luxury of trying to do these things but without the pressures of directly advising governments and so forth. Um, the hope is that some of the work done will continue now that people know the importance of it and that it will be starting from a further on place next time particularly things like the data infrastructure that we've been talking about with that works ongoing for the next 18 months now with some grant funding so we're hoping that when everyone has time to draw breath there will be a chance to look at all these different dis disparate efforts and say how could we learn from all of them and what pieces could we have in place to be more ready next time and then see how it's completely different and what doesn't apply better. Yeah, the simple thing that we'll definitely do differently for the next pandemic is 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 that is that our animal disease work will absolutely be using our data pipeline, um, and so we'll be able to we'll have much 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 better um, traceability of all of the analyses that we're doing that previously we didn't have, and uh, and that I think that'll make a huge difference to our ability to to demonstrate confidence in in the in the modelling work early on. Great. Uh, and, and just to give Chris the opportunity to also weigh in on, on what he would do, I realize we're a bit over time and we'll, we'll try and wrap this up uh, quickly. Oh, I'll do it very quickly. I think I would look after my mental health a bit better. So, I mean, basically, obviously that period, the number of hours worked was ridiculous, but also I was watching hundreds upon hundreds of simulations where you were having like 10 million, 20 million people be infected or die every day and that was pretty much every day for April and May and you had to distance yourself from that about how bad it could be and also just watching how no one was paying attention to things like masks and everything else and you got very het up on it and so it was if I was doing it again one I would probably wouldn't be on the ground doing the coding but I would as a manager be looking out more for the mental health of the people doing the work and basically saying to them look you're making models, the whole point you're doing this is to avoid that horrible future that you're predicting and people will listen and it will get better. And 
you know, just because they're not paying any attention now to the fact it's going to get really bad. The whole point of reason you exist is because they will eventually listen and it will get better. Yeah, but some sobering thoughts, but uh, de definitely important important uh, lessons to take on board. Um, right, so I, I think that's a, probably a good place for us to call a wrap on this. Um, covered quite a wide variety of topics and I, I hope everyone has uh, found it quite interesting and, and gained at least something from it. Um, but I think invariably we've really only scratched the surface of, of a lot of these, these different topics. Um, I, I've put a small reading list together as I was going through sort of preparing for this and I'm just gonna post that now, uh, make sure I share it to everyone. Uh, so you can go through and, and find out more about not the panelists and their work and, and also uh, some other sources that, that are probably sort of of interest for this, this topic. Um, I'd like to thank uh, you, the audience, for, for the, all the questions and the engagement. That, that was great. Definitely uh, really helped the discussion. Uh, and most importantly, I, I really want to thank my panelists uh, for contributing some excellent content today. Uh, and also putting up with all of my emails that I sent uh, in, in the lead up to this event and getting it organized. Uh, so with that, I, I will pass it back to Terry. Thank you so much. And, yeah, and I just wanted to follow up and say a massive thank you to everybody. Thank you to Matthew for organizing this. It was really wonderful, really interesting. And I think it was great to hear not only about how, what was going on happening related to COVID, but also what it means to be an RSE. So, um, on behalf of the society, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, so yeah, well done. Man of applause. I, I, I will clap on behalf of everybody. Um, so I think um, we normally have a little networking session, but I know that we have been in this room for an hour and a half. So totally understandable if everybody just wants to run away and make a certain cup of tea. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for coming along. Thank you to our wonderful audience. Um, if people want to hang around, I'll be here for another five, 10 minutes, if not, Thank you for coming and please come to our next event um, on January the 20th where we have our lightning talk session.